This is Real Organ Lifestyle with Andrea Fay and Jen Fiddler, two licensed real estate brokers who share their love of all things Oregon. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Real Oregon Lifestyle. I'm Andrea Fay. I'm Jen Fiddler. And today we've got a fun episode. We're going to be talking all about college rentals and uh, the benefits of them and how you can use that in your toolbox uh, for investments for yourself and um, ways to use them when your kids are in college. So Jen, um, I understand that you have put together some numbers um, and those can apply to the Portland area and the Corvallis area. Price ranges might be slightly different, but um, what do you got for us? Yeah, first, I guess, um, start with a little bit of an introduction. We did a previous uh, episode on funding, using rentals for funding your retirement and wake up money and having those rentals paid off and just money coming into your inbox every um, month. And so what we were kind of trying to spin this episode to was how to fund college tuition. College is super expensive, um, as we know. It's gotten a lot more expensive in the last 10 years. And um, the benefits of college, you know, coming out with a college degree are, are very important. Um, average college graduates earn 89% more than people with just a high school diploma. Um, college costs are rising mm -hmm. and they're expensive expecting that in 15 years, the average um, amount of tuition, books, room and board will be about $207,000 for four years. So yeah, they're, they're crazy and they keep just going up. They do. And most college students either come out with a tremendous amount of debt that they just can't get rid of or um, their parents come out with a lot of debt or their parents use you know, different avenues for funding savings accounts. But we thought one good way to approach um, funding a college uh, tuition was to look at rentals and how to do that and how to leverage rentals to fund your kid's college. So Andy, if you wanna pull up the worksheets that I sent, Uh, we talked a little bit about this, you know, um, college makes a difference, education makes a difference. Obviously, we talked about, you know, um, how to pay for college. Uh, we've talked about how the costs are rising. So scroll down a little bit. So this, this particular example is a property that um, somebody purchased with putting 20% down on a $200,000 rental property. Um, if you look at it just from a term in terms of equity in five years, that's worth 80,000 in equity in 10 years, 132,000 in equity. And that's assuming no increase in property value. Um, in the second example, putting uh, 20 percent down on a two hundred thousand dollar property in 10 years at five percent appreciation you could have two hundred and fifty eight thousand dollars in equity so in 10 years you could potentially pay for four years of college with a rental for your kids now the great benefit to that is that you didn't actually save that two hundred and fifty eight thousand dollars you had somebody else paying the mortgage. So your $40,000, you had somebody else paying the mortgage on that by having it as a rental during that 10 year period or having your kids rent from you. And there you go, you have college paid for. That um, I think is a, an excellent plan. And you know, you might as well work smarter, not harder, right? I mean, that's the whole idea behind this is, you know, you can, your initial investment is not very much, but it's amazing how someone else paying that mortgage will really make a huge difference. And correct me if I'm wrong, you guys, I think I learned this from you a couple episodes ago. If you put 20% down, you don't have mortgage insurance. And so it, it, it does for your principal uh, or your payments go to your principal much more. Yeah. I mean, you, you just, if you're not paying mortgage insurance, then that's just, that's going towards your principal. Um, but, you know, it, it depends on the loan program because on investment property, um, you might have to put a little bit more down uh, and it's going to be 20 to 25 percent depending on the loan program. So, yeah, it's 
it just financially, it makes just a ton of sense and you don't have to do anything really. Yeah, you do need to make sure you can manage those rentals, but um, you know, you can also have a property manager doing that as well. Absolutely. I also worked up some numbers because I mean, $200,000 at least in both of our areas is a little bit unrealistic as far as the price range goes. So I pulled up a property in the Portland area just to give you guys an idea, this particular property was listed at $344,999. Um, so I rounded it up to $345. Um, the $69,000 down payment is what you would need as at your initial investment. I've got, of course, closing costs and everything in there as well. I'm assuming a 4.25% interest rate on a 30 year fixed, which is about what investment property rates are at now. Which, by the way, is extremely low. Um, yeah. We've seen investment property um, interest rates much higher than that in the past. So this is, these are like all-time lows. Yeah, absolutely. So between the tax savings, the debt reduction, and the what you actually leverage, your return on investment is 28% on this particular property year one. And that's factoring in an 8% property management fee. So obviously, the longer you own that particular um, rental, the more cash flow you're going to have per month. But for the purposes of saving for uh, a rental or for saving for college tuition for your kids, it actually doesn't really matter what your cash flow is as long as it's close to cash flowing, because what you're banking on is the equity and being able to sell that property or 1031 exchange it later in the future or do something with it to help them pay for that college tuition. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, I, I would like to scroll to the next page and see what that looks like. So you'll have to read that because I can't see it. <laughs> So at the end of year five, your cash flow is about $165 a month. So essentially, you're, I mean, yeah, that doesn't sound great. But again, the purpose of this particular scenario is equity. And so what you're yeah, looking at at the 10 year view. Um, yeah. Cash flow is not the goal. It's, it's you're right, it's building building equity. And as long as you enter into it, a lot of people think that oh, if I'm getting a rental, then I need to I need to get cash flow from it. Well, that's not necessarily the case. You're still growing that investment, even if you're not getting money from it every month. Exactly, and you're leveraging you know the best possible way because you just I mean it's really hard to save two hundred and seven thousand dollars in a savings account for a kid for college. Um, if you're having a renter pay your mortgage every month, you're essentially having that that renter pay for your kid's college in, in essence. And, you know, if you bought in a college town like Corvallis when your kid's three years old, by the time they're 18 and they're ready to go to school, even if they don't go to Oregon State, if you used a 15 year fixed mortgage, that could potentially be paid off. And I don't know about you, but the rental rates in this area are skyrocketing. They're just increasing every year. And, I'd like to hear your thoughts on Corvallis. Yeah, as far as Corvallis goes, I mean, if we're looking at rental rates per bedroom, we're, you know, average is going to be six to 700, depending on the proximity to campus. And the closer that house is to campus, um, say if, if it's within walking distance, um, then it's going to be valued a little bit more because parents want to see that their kids don't have to you know, drive very far or have to look for parking um, to actually get to their classes. And so the closer to campus is more valuable. Um, but that's, I mean, you can get a, a pretty penny. And um, like I said, even even if you're not cash flowing, um, the rents are, are very high right now. And, um, you know, we have seen in the Corvallis market that we have seen more apartment buildings being built. Um, so, you know, but there's still a housing shortage. And that housing shortage transfers also to rental um, property as well. And everybody needs a place to live, um, especially the college students. So 
you know, that six to seven hundred dollars per bedroom is is about average. It could be more if it's a nicer property and and closer to campus. Yeah, totally. Well, and you know, even if you didn't buy the property in advance for your kids, let's say your kid decided that he wanted to go to OSU next year and you started looking for rental properties, you had them get two or three roommates and, you know, rent those rooms out at $700 a month. And even in four years, the amount of equity that you would get off of that is, is just tremendous. We see that quite a bit, even if it's... um because you're you're absolutely right. Kids don't always want to go. Like, say, if you you purchased one in Corvallis, um, thinking that your kid is going to want to go to OSU, and then you find out later your kid doesn't want to go to OSU, um, you still have that rental and you still have built up that equity. Um, if they did want to go to OSU, you could still use that property uh, when it comes time and um, and have a place for your kid to, you know, to actually live out of. And uh, be a little bit out of your hair, because trust me, they don't want to live with mom and dad. <laughs> and uh, and then also getting the roommates, then that that wouldn't be hard to do. Um, but if you know, if not, that money is still there, built up in that house. Yeah, absolutely. I just see college rentals as a huge tool and and a great way to to fund college expenses. And I think it's something that people don't look at and. You know, like I said before, you, so let's just say you don't even have the $40,000 down payment. There's other ways that you can leverage money that you have, um, you know, whether that be a 401k to put down on a on an investment property, whether that be, um, you know, start saving when the kid is born, just a monthly amount as much as you can afford and put that towards the down payment in the future when they turn 18. There's a lot of ways to start building that, even that initial down payment early on. You can also use the equity in your own home yep. and, um, you know, cash some of that out, uh, maybe get a line of credit or refinance and um, use some of that as a down payment. There's plenty of ways to do it. And um, the point is to start. If you don't start, then, you know, it, you're going to be a little bit late as far as if the goal is to have enough money for your college, you know, for, for the, your kid to go to college, then um, start at the appropriate time. <laughs> yeah, which when I see these numbers, I'm like, start when they're born. Right. <laughs> the second Absolutely. they come out, just start saving what you can and do what you can and then start looking at these options in the future. You know, things always change. And I know kids are extremely expensive. I don't know. I don't have them. But I hear from my friends that they're extremely ex expensive. But there are ways, like Andrea mentioned, to 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 leverage your own properties and stuff to, to get these kind of situations and scenarios going. And so um, if you do have, you know, if any interest in using investment properties, either to fund your retirement, like we talked about in the past, or to fund uh, college tuition, we're happy to answer questions. We're happy to put together these spreadsheets for you and look at different scenarios. We're, we're here to help anytime. Absolutely. And, you know, I think one big question that I, I think a lot of people have, especially since I, you know, I sell college rentals quite frequently being in Corvallis. And, um, you know, I, I sold one this summer and um, I will say that those rentals are not exclusively, you know, people that want their kids to be close to campus. Sometimes they can only afford so much. And so, um, for instance, I sold one in Philomath this summer um, for, um, for one of uh, my client's daughters to go to school. Um, they already lined up... Um, some tenants and you know other all, other college kids to rent the the other bedroom before school even started. Um, but you know it's not exclusive to that. But I think some of the other questions are, you know, if I do a college rental, are those college kids going to trash the place? And the answer is sometimes. <laughs> Maybe it, it is possible, but you have to know going into it that. You know, most of most of the stuff that they're going to be doing is going is cosmetic damage, and um, that's actually really inexpensive to change and replace. And I, I know some investors that just focus on college rentals. That's their cup of tea. That's what they're good at, 
Um, they actually like the fact that, um, you know, a lot of times the college students leave every year. And so they have more of a chance to turn things over. And in that opportunity, you also have the, the chance to replace carpet, replace flooring. And generally, a lot of those rentals end up being a little bit more up to date. Yeah, absolutely. I'll say that for sure. With with a turnover, I see turnover as opportunity from uh, an invest being an investor myself. I want to be in that rental as much as possible to see what's going on and be able to repair and fix things. And you know, when it's potentially vacant from you know July to at the end of August, that's a great time to go in there and do improvements and things like that. And again, you know, keep in mind, worst case scenario is usually paint and carpet and those kind of things. But a lot of times expectations of college students aren't that great anyway. I know when I was renting in college, I didn't expect that there would be new carpet and new paint every time. You know, there's, there's, you know, you, you don't obviously want to have a slum, but you can also get away with a little bit more because college students aren't expecting brand new. That is so true. There are some, like each each town has different regulations as far as um, what meets code and things like that. And we do find that there are some, um, there are college kids that will rent a house and maybe there is one room in the house that's not considered a bedroom, but they end up using it as a bedroom. Um, you know, that's one of those things that, um, you know, probably not legal, but the landlord a lot of times doesn't know how the students are using those rooms. So um, it's something to just watch for and just make sure, you know, as a landlord that you let people know that, no, this is indeed not a bedroom. This is an office or whatever it may be. Um, but we, we do see it quite a bit. And especially since there is a housing shortage, college, college kids, they get creative. They do. They get yeah. creative. Not always in a safe way either. <laughs> yeah. Personally, it, I don't think it would scare me to have a college rental. I mean, I look back on, you know, what I was doing in college. And again, yeah, we spilled some stuff on the carpet and things like that. But I mean, for the most part, most people are pretty respectful. And, um, you know, they don't, even college kids don't want to live in a dump. <laughs> no, they don't. And, you know, it, a lot of times it's just a cleaning thing mm -hmm. and it may not even be that they had a big party and there was damage just due to the parties. It may just be, you know, these kids are learning how to clean up after themselves. Their parents have done it all their lives and all of a sudden they need to learn how to use a broom. <laughs> and so it's, it's a new experience for everybody involved. And, um, you know, when it comes to selling them, it is still possible to sell college rentals with the college students in the home. Um, that a lot of times is a, you know, a myth that that can't be done very well. It can. And a lot of times, you know, the parents are the ones that are instructing the kids, like, you better have that house clean before you're first showing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, we kind of talked about all of the different objections that people have and everything. Um, yeah, there's pros and cons and there's things that you just need to know going into it. But um, even if you didn't want to buy in a college town, let's just say you wanted to buy a rental in a different state and then sell it in 15 years when you have equity, that could be a way to fund your, you don't have to rent to college kids, you know? Oh, absolutely. There's yeah. And I mean, a property manager is also going to be really helpful in um, in making sure that you have a renter that's going to be paying and that's um, you know going to be a decent renter. Um, we really do rely on those uh, those property managers, and they with a lot. We have a lot of changing laws in Oregon, at least you know as of the last couple of years. And those property managers really know their stuff, and they really are worth their weight in gold. Absolutely. I think, yeah. you know, moral of the story on both our uh, Wake Up Money one and this one is always hire a good property manager. It's definitely worth it. I, I definitely think so. And at least the people that I have, um, you know, in transactions, we actually, my folks bought a duplex a couple months ago. 
and um, the previous owners did not use a property manager. And I could just tell by the way some of the things were, some of the records were kept and um, the way some of the things were handled that they didn't use a property manager at all. And just from my standpoint, just watching and seeing how that went, um, I could tell that they were quite vulnerable to um, just for the fact that they were not doing things. Uh, it wasn't that they weren't ethical. It was that they just weren't doing things the way they should nowadays. Yeah, absolutely. And property managers stay up on rents too. I had a client who we were trying to sell an investment property that she had and looking at all the options and just based on the amount of money that she was getting per month per rent for rent, we just couldn't make the numbers work to sell it, you know, as a as a good investment. And so property managers will help you keep up your rents so that you have a marketable marketable property when you go to sell it and that rents are where they need to be. You know, that brings up a good point. I had one one time where um, it was a college rental and um, the the owners had gotten um, a suggestion as far as what rents should be, but they hadn't they hadn't actually changed the rents yet. Um, and this was uh, last year, but they needed to sell the property. Uh, their college student was graduating and it was time to move on. And um, anyway, I will say that there were questions about whether or not um, that property really was valuable. Um, we still got the price that we wanted, but there were questions about it because at the time, even though we were being told it could rent for a certain amount because we didn't have the records showing that it could rent for that amount, um, people questioned it for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Records are very, very important. And again, property managers, they're awesome. Yeah, definitely. And I like your idea. I mean, even though we love Oregon, um, there are options in other cities and states to start those investments. And um, I never think that anyone should rule those out. I think that they could be really, really valuable and maybe a good place to start. And maybe at some point, when you feel comfortable, you can sell that property in another state and then move it back over to Oregon. Um, you know, price ranges are quite a bit different across the country and that could be a good way to just start. Yeah, absolutely. I've looked at investing in other states and one thing that I always take into account is what major corporations are there, what are coming in, what the employment situation looks like. Is it you know, a lot of short-term workers, is it long-term? And kind of taking all of those things into consideration. And one place that I had looked at, property values, you could get, you could easily get a rental for $200,000. That was really nice. And rental rates were still pretty good. And, you know, for my particular situation, I didn't really care if it cash flowed. I was just kind of hoping that in the future it would be paid off. Um, you know, and it and it did cash flow really well, actually, when I was looking at the numbers. So it's it's worth, you know, that's the other thing we can help you with is we know a lot of agents around the country just from being in networking groups and coaching groups and things like that. Um, we're always happy to help hook you up with agents in other areas for, you know, investment properties or primaries as well. We know people all over all over the nation, actually. We know people. <laughs> Well, and it's one of those things where, you know, your your agent that you work with is really a team member and we're all working as a team to make this happen and, and help you accomplish your goals. Sometimes the route that you take may not be necessarily what you think it needs to be and it doesn't necessarily have to be the conventional route that everybody else takes when it comes to rental property. Um, so, you know, get creative. It, it It's just about starting. And if you can start, that's the most important part. So Yeah, I love helping people with these situations and figuring out kind of complicated situations and how to make things work and get people to be creative and think about stuff outside of the box. Um, I, I just think that real estate is a great way to build your financial future. And I get really excited about these situations and I get really excited when I hear what people are doing. So, um, you know, I've helped people build rental portfolios and I love it. Everything from Airbnbs to retirement vehicles to 
paying for college. It's a lot of fun seeing when you start showing people what real estate can do for you that no other type of investment can do. Oh, yeah. You can't get a return on investment like you can with real estate. You just can't. Um, it's not out there. And in the stock market, you know, that goes up and down quite frequently. Um, and if you know, I don't know the stock market quite as well as some people do. And so for me, I don't feel comfortable putting my money in it as much. And um, but real estate, I, I know so much better. And, you know, even people always have these questions. Well, what happens if the market tanks or whatever? Um, you know what, you still have someone paying that mortgage. And usually, you know, we don't have those huge spikes um, in a university town. Um, you know, we have, yeah, we might see a little bit of a drop, but not not crazy. The university seems to shelter um, a lot of the pricing. Um, and so we don't really see that huge fluctuation in a college town. Yeah. And ultimately, rents don't usually go down even in a recession. And one thing to think about with real estate, a lot of the um, strategies that we talk about are, are long-term strategies, short-term investments, flips, things like that. That's a totally different type of investing and strategy that we can talk about at some point in the future. But a lot of these are meant to be long-term strategies. Um, I'm just not a huge fan of looking at real estate as a quick flip type of thing. Their flips are, they're hard to make a lot of money on. I like the idea of keeping real estate long-term. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. Our market really does not support a good flipping market. Um, most of the, the house flippers, if you know them, and my family has flipped a lot of houses, um, so we have a ton of experience with it. But we're not out really seeing, um, there's not, there's no such thing as a good deal right now. Um, it's just, you know, you might find something that might be a little bit cheaper if it's off market. Um, but it's, it's really tough to find. And the idea of flipping a house, um, you're just not going to make the money that people think that you are. HGTV, we love them and we hate them, um, has done a great job of making it look fashionable and, uh, making it look like it's easy. But in reality, it's, it's just not, it's not a good market for flipping. Yeah. And it could be in other states, you know, um, that's again, where we go back to our team of people we know around the nation, there could be great markets for flipping right now that we're unaware of. So, you know, just not here, <laughs> just not here. <laughs> well, I, I think that's all we have time for today. Um, thank you all for joining us and catch us on Instagram, Facebook, and realoregonlifestyle.com. Thank you.